Hi, this is Paul, and I'm having a conversation today with John Van Sloten. John Van Sloten is an author. He's a friend of mine. He's also a Christian Reformed minister. This is his latest book, Every Job a Parable, and we'll probably talk about some of his earlier books, too. Um, thank you so much, John, for, for having this conversation with me. Paul, thanks for asking. <laughs> why don't you, uh, people know me, it's my channel, but they don't know you, so why don't you... Why don't you share a little bit about yourself, and, and don't be too brief. Uh, you might include some of the stuff in your first book, um, maybe how you, you know, your Christian life, how you became a pastor, what you're dealing with now. Just give folks a good introduction. And to where I'm at. All right. Um, I'll chew up the whole hour uh, <laughs> telling my story again. Then we'll do another I, uh, one. No problem. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll be uh, I'll be reasonable. I'm. Uh, uh, pastor of a Christian Reformed Church here in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So what Denver is to the Rockies, uh, Calgary is to the Rockies a little bit north. And uh, I've been doing that for 22 years. Before that, I was a real estate developer uh, back in Toronto. So I built shopping centers and office buildings uh, and the like and loved that job and then had a bit of a personal um, uh, turnaround point, a conversion experience although it was very much akin to the theology of the church I was a part of. I, I, there wasn't a lot of free will. I kind of had this spontaneous <laughs> confession to a, a pastor. Uh, I was attending a church, and a, a pastor asked me how, how I was doing, and I started to confess all of this duplicity in my life, and I was a, I was a real SOB businessman and, and in all kinds of other uh, moral ways, uh, um, yeah, in a place of, of, of great brokenness. And so, uh, yeah, for some reason he asked and for some reason I answered and I thought I'm going to be done. Um, they're going to kick me out of this church because as far as I knew, everybody in this church had their, their stuff together. And, uh, and I thought for sure I'd get kicked out of my marriage when I got home. So it, it started for me a transition from developer to pastor with that confession. And then three months later, uh, the birth of my third uh, child, our third child, uh, Edward, with Down syndrome, which was a total surprise to us and uh, changed everything. Uh, everything that I was as a developer was uh, superficial, it was about the next house, the next car, the next whatever. And uh, my definition was based on what other people thought and how well I was performing and succeeding in life. And here to that man, that father, comes a boy who is the antithesis of that. And uh, it was a disaster for me. I was, I'll be honest, I was, a, I was, I was not able to handle it uh, at first. And then uh, through a series of events in the ensuing months, um, I just had all kinds of parable-like stories happen in my life that affirmed uh, or, or gave hope. And, uh, and one in particular, I went on a road trip into uh, Rochester, New York on a community service trip with some kids from our church, and I met four people with Down syndrome at different ages that all told the opposite story of four scenarios I ran about how sh shitty it's going to be to be uh, the parent. <laughs> in Canada, are you allowed to use that word? I don't know if you're you use it on YouTube, too. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I will not go beyond that. But I, I just thought this would be a horrible life experience. And I ran scenarios. Then he was born, literal scenarios, four of them, of how bad it was going to be. And each of those, almost to, to the year, to the age of, of the person with Down syndrome I met, was, was, was retold and renewed. And I, I met an 18-year-old who had a life and an eight-year-old who was physically strong. And and a 40-year-old who, who was able to live on his own. And so anyway, uh, reconciling uh, or that moment where God, um, in my understanding, God uh, kind of set me up to show me uh, what's, what, what, what Edward's birth is really all about and more importantly, who God is and how much God is holding everything. That was a, the conversion moment into ministry. Um, it took me a year or so to to kind of get into a seminary and, and go into the to, into the formal studies of ministry. But so big conversion, and then for the last twenty two years, um, up until last year, a year ago uh, yesterday, um, I worked as a pastor of a church, and we started off trying to be a relevant church, and then one day relevance turned into revelation, and uh, this idea that God is moving in the world. 
uh, quite outside of the church and doing just fine, um, speaking his truth and bringing life and flourishing and, 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 and providentially moving things along and holding people and loving people. Um, that, that took hold in me. Um, and again, it wasn't, a, it was a bit of a, a drive by conversion. I, I, I was not looking for it. I did not start the church with the idea that we'd start looking for God in the world and naming God's presence in, in, well, everything. Um, but when I saw it for what it was and, uh, and, uh, and realized, I, I still remember the blog post. It must have been like, it was like Paul Vanderclay length blog post. It was huge. <laughs> I said, if this is true, if, if God is moving in the world, you know, as a Christian, God moves and speaks through the Bible. But if God is speaking through creation too, and that these two books are meant to talk to each other, I mean, this changes everything. And so I have been pursuing that uh, idea by preaching on pop culture and science and work. And then once I'd done enough sermons, I guess, uh, hey, this would be a good book. Or once I was in enough trouble with the seminary, I better write this down so that everybody can understand what I'm doing, um, trying to do. Um, and have discovered that the tradition that you and I share theologically is actually the probably the only one within which you can find theolo a theological imprimatur for a worldview that's as big as this. And so I've been doing a lot of theological growth and preaching these sermons. And then, uh, yeah, last year stopped at the church in order to write. I'm writing a book on faith and science right now and, um, and, and release the book uh, that you just uh, held up. Uh, it got released in North America and then it got picked up in the UK too. So it's kind of uh, a growing thing author wise. And, and I've got a few more I think I need to write, but I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up. I, uh, yesterday I was speaking at a, in, in the next province over in British Columbia to a group of a hundred union labor representatives. And it was, the, the room was filled with, they, they all got a free copy of my book and they'd all read it. They'd all read it. And, uh, <laughs> Unlike if you give it out in a church. They were dog-eared. Like, and they, these guys were smart. And, they, you know, guys and gals, they were, they were all great, uh, gifted uh, uh, labor negotiators, right? So it was a bit of an intimidating crowd. Well, I had this deeply compelling conversation, unpacking the nature of their work and naming how, how when they, they negotiate the way they do and they problem solve the way they do and they, et cetera, et cetera, they're like God. You image God in these very particular union ways. And uh, so I thought, ah, I could work for these guys and do that for the rest, <laughs> rest of my life. But anyway, so I'm trying to figure out, but the idea is God's speaking everywhere. And, and I am uh, all about trying to see that and name that and come alongside people and, and say, hey, well, well, you your first book was um, was about Metallica. Why don't you say a little bit about that and and say a little bit about your first book? Because I, I remember I, I first met John. We were both on a board, the Board of Home Missions, yeah, and the Christian Reformed Church. And and I had heard a little bit about John before, and but I um, and then I met John, and then I I don't know if you gave it to me or if I bought it. Um, I got your first book, and I read that book, and I was just I was just weeping. Uh, uh, the your, the story of your conversion of, um, you know, that some of the, you know, version of the story that you just told and it just, just powerful. And, and at that point I, you know, people, some of the people on my channel listen to my sermons now. I mean, I had done, I had done the movie type thing for a while in the church and I got into some, some trouble for that with a few people, but living stones is a very gracious place. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, but I, but the Metallica, the Metallica thing was fascinating and that, that seemed with Metallica and baseball, that seemed to launch this kind of this parallel, um, this parallel career for you for a while. And why don't you talk a little bit yeah. about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, like you, I was engaging culture as a relevant, uh, way of bridging to the, to the broader world. And, uh, and the Metallica thing, I mean, this, those were early days in terms of this idea of God speaking through two books. But I think at that time, already a healthy sense of respect for 
you know, that God could have something to do with heavy metal was there. And uh, a kid in my church, a young, a young preteen uh, boy came up after a sermon on U2, which is a pretty Christian band to preach, and said, hey, Pastor John, would you ever preach on my favorite band? And before I found out what his band was, I said, yes. And, uh, <laughs> and then he, uh, he said, Metallica. And I said, oh, and we both kind of looked at the floor and, and I, I I gave him the, the pastoral slough off, which was, uh, <laughs> let me pray about it. And, and the next day, the next day uh, uh, some newbies, a new guy in our church, Jason, phoned me up and gave me, uh, said, hey, Pastor Dan, I got two tickets to the Metallica concert next month in Calgary. Would you and your wife uh, like to go? And so I took that as a divine sign and went. And, um, and I did a bit of homework on the band and uh, read all their lyrics and, and started to hear echoes of the Old Testament prophets, very literal echoes in terms of some of the things that they referenced in their lyrics, uh, but also echoes in terms of a wrathful passion uh, toward injustice in all of the the uh, all that's wrong in the world and all of the manipulation uh, that happens in a, in a capital C capitalist uh, society, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so they were getting mad at the same things the prophets were getting mad at. And then, and then my heart got converted at the concert when um, you know two thirds of the way through the, the set they they sing nothing else matters. And it it was like a seventeen thousand Calgarians all crying out before God. This communal lament. Uh, at how broken things are and uh, what really matters in life and this big existential cry. And and my heart broke. I, I remember turning around from the stage. We were right on the stage on the floor and I just turned around and looked at all these people and, and felt as though I was feeling God's heart for uh, a crowd full of metalheads. And so I ended up preaching the sermon and uh, Metallica heard about it and Lars Ulrich was being interviewed, the drummer, by a a DJ from CJ, a local rock station, and they told him about this church, and Lars couldn't believe it. He said, I think this is something amazing, and uh, Lars phoned up Warner Music Canada and said, uh, can you go to this church and film it? Because they, uh, they were in town that week, but they had to go on tour, so... And so I get a call from Warner Music Canada on Saturday night saying, are you the pastor who's preaching on Metallica? And at the time, they're taking down Napster, right? So I think they're going to take me down. <laughs> they're going after us churches now. <laughs> no, 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 no. Lars just wants to, us to film it for him. And so they did. And, uh, you know, we did our, uh, you know, of course, you do your three Metallica songs as your call to worship. And uh, I preached a sermon on how Metallica get angry about the same thing as Old Testament prophets do. And the story got picked up and it hit the wire. It went around the world. I was interviewed in Irish national radio and rock stations around North America. And and that story does not easily get forgotten at this union talk that I was at yesterday. Somebody had heard about this Metallica sermon, and to them it was brand new, right? So they were heading out to get the book. So, so what have you learned about, because I remember when I, um, when I met you in Grand Rapids for our board meeting, you made a comment to me something about you're a it, it was, it was, I, I, I remember, you know, we always remember what's important to us Our, you know, these, these watchers inside our head that are keeping track of things that our conscious mind isn't. I remember you making a comment about, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a, a, you know, I'm kind of a, you didn't say it this way, but it's kind of, I'm kind of a glory hound. I get in the papers and I'm looking to this and you did a lot of that for a while. And, you know, on our last conversation that wasn't on YouTube, um, you know, I noted some reflection in you about that. And, and what have you learned about, about that? On one hand, obviously, picking up, getting picked up, you know, in a sense, this is every church planter's dream, right? Because you're thinking, yeah. well, everybody's going to hear about me and everybody's going to know this and my name's going to be everywhere. And, well, you know, now, okay, that happened. You know, I think, I think sometimes about um, Robin Williams, who had this great story how he, you know, he won an Academy Award and, and he said, you know, that lasted about a week. And, and then I was walking out of a place that I had just done a comedy set and someone turned to me and said, hey, Mork. And, you know, bang, right, you know, right back into. So, so you've been through this in ways that I, I know a lot of church planters, obviously, a lot of church planters would dream of. And now, you know, now you're in this different thing. What, any reflections yeah. on it? 
Well, the transition uh, story is is probably uh, the most incisive inflection point in terms of my thoughts on that. I uh, a year ago, a year and a month ago, was was at a Toronto Blue Jays game at the invitation of the Major League Baseball team's owners. Uh, they'd asked if they could use a sermon I'd preached in the previous year for their marketing for their fall playoff run. Um, so I signed off on sermon material so they could market it on national television here in Canada. Um, they, they, they came and interviewed. They gave us free tickets. They put us up in a hotel. You could watch the game in the owner's box. They had cameras everywhere you signed your whole life away uh, that they could take whatever you said and put it anywhere and then uh, one of the guys comes up to me between uh, in in the first inning of the Cleveland game taps me on the shoulder and says hey watch what's going to happen between the first and the second inning and uh, sure enough there's my big fat head being interviewed between the the first and second inning at a Blue Jays game and I'm in the owner's box and and what was troublesome to me was that I could not stop myself from reaching into my pocket and getting a phone and taking a picture of myself. I mean, if this is not C.S. Lewis's, the self filled with self, filled with self, filled with self, and then post this. Wow. I, I, I remember knowing it was the wrong thing to do, right? Um, grabbing for the attention that way, right? And, and, uh, and I, it, it hasn't been like that the whole way. It hasn't. I mean, I mean, this has happened. This has happened twenty, fifty, maybe a hundred times with everything from a newspaper story to a radio interview to these bigger things with Metallica, the Jays. Um, you're right. It, it none of it really matters <laughs> after a while. You're 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 on to the next thing. I mean. I, I don't. I don't think I called it a glory hound. I, I think my friend said it was a media prostitute. Not, I, <laughs> um, I thought it was an uglier word than that. Actually, it was an uglier word than that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for your, for your general audience. Um, so I've always wondered, like God, uh, you take this guy to whom you um, you give this beautiful Down syndrome kid to humble him and show him that identity is not about performance. It's not about being seen. It's not, not about being known. And then you call him into the ministry and he's happy to do that work. And I think would have been just fine, you know, in some little corner uh, of, of the church, just serving and, and am. Um, and then this starts to happen and then these calls happen and then you get to write and there's a, there's a different kind of attention that comes from that than as opposed to a TV interview or, or a radio inter interview. And, and, and I, I remember feeling, thinking back, uh, really? <laughs> you sure? You sure you can trust? Like it's still a little too fresh. That was 15 <laughs> years ago that I was that person, right? Yeah. Um, and felt that I could steward it, and uh, but but not all the time. Not 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 at that Blue Jays game. That was that was that was just offside. That was that was King David in the Old Testament counting his armies. Uh, I just read that story this morning, and and you know, looking for sales or looking online for media hits or likes or you know whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I am that guy who 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 couldn't hold his phone and keep his phone in his pocket at, at that Blue Jays game in that place who's been called by God to go around and name where God is moving in the world in all kinds of amazing places that are, you know, in the naming is getting people's attention and they're, 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 they're wanting to hear more. Yeah. And, and so it is a, you know, this past year has been deeply humbling in terms of the leaving of a church and a little bit of conflict, not, not too bad, but, um, and then, and then out into this nether world, this, 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 uh, wilderness. And I, I figured things would pick up by now and somebody would want to hire me or the book would take off. And, <laughs> and it's like crickets, it's like crickets for my life right now. And, and it's, it's been so good in terms of um, getting me back to my first love and, you know, the, the grace of being a total freaking loser and being called by God into the ministry, right? Like, you know, you talk about Jordan Peterson and all the, the stuff you're doing there, right? And I've caught a few things, but I, I love the, the definition of his audience and, you know, the young men who are 
kind of lost and looking and want to know who they are and how they fit in. And, and I mean, I was that guy. I was a Rush fan when I was a Toronto kid growing up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same age as Peterson. And, and I figured they should play Rush at his, uh, at his events. Everyone's existential questions, trying to figure out who they are. And, yeah, yeah. and so, yeah, yeah. But I think that's, you know, the juxtaposition of that kind of character with a little bit of attention and having to deal with the strain of that, it's, and that it says God thing all over it to me. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, uh, the hardness of this past year, I said to my wife uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think this is what it feels like to have your pride die. This is your inordinate pride, C.S. Lewis type of pride, right? You filled with you always about you. Um, uh, I feel like it's dying again and hopefully, that leaves me in a more humble place to keep going forward. Uh, yeah, the other stuff is all pretty transient, right? It's it, they're cool stories and make for great book titles, but um, but now I feel all I want is to know him more and to 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 tell people when I need to, whether it's the person across the street, um, meeting him on on you know on the sidewalk or or doing an interview in London. Uh, I, I'll do whatever I need to do, but I want those two to feel kind of the same. Um, and I want to be the same person in both. And so, oh my goodness, this is a confession. I'm going to go lie on my couch right now and we can continue. <laughs> I'm <laughs> a continue pastor, not a therapist. Uh, <laughs> Thank but, you, Pastor Paul. You know, but, you know, and that's, you know, again, thinking about your book and, and thinking about, you know, I, I often... So, so when I talk to, when I talk to people who are on the religious page, skeptical or atheist, you know, they will, they will, the, the most, the most common thing that will offer, one of the most common things that'll come up is, you know, God, well, you, you know, where, where is God? I mean, why didn't he stick his head out of the clouds or, you know, something like this. And, and I often think about, the hiddenness of God in terms of his humility. And, and what I love about your work is, is that God shows up all over, but mm. he doesn't show up all over saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. And that God, you know, I, so I often, when I, sometimes I get asked to teach, you know, like an hour about the Bible or an hour about Christianity, and I'll almost always go to glory and talk about the fact that, um, you know, we're made, we're made to, to make glory. We take, you know, these, these tiny little bitter things that grew in, in Eurasia that we now call apples, and we turn them into this, you know, this amazing fruit that you can find in your supermarket, which is big and red and juicy and sweet. And, and, and this is glory. And so we take eggs and flour and, you know, this huge long line of human civilization and, and we make a cake out of it. And let's imagine the best baker in the world makes a wonderful cake. And, and what glory means is that they put that cake in front of people and people look at its beauty. And then at the sacrifice of the beauty of the cake, they cut it and they eat a piece and they, and, and you know, the, the, the good baker watches their face and just sees, sees how glory multiplies. And the way that that baker would destroy glory would be to insert him or herself and say, I made that cake. Yeah. And, and so then glory would be diminished. And, and when you think about that, and when I look at, when I look at your stories and, and what you tell here, I see I see the humble God all over the place who is just enjoying the glory he has put and packed into the world that people can't even see. And, and even people who don't know him or deny him or doubt him have moments where they see that glory. And I think God just looks at them and just, enjoys that moment and just thinks, you know, isn't it great? You know, yeah. you doubt me. You don't like me. You, you use my name for cursing, but you just uncorked that bottle of wine and wasn't it filled with glory? 
Hmm. And, and I think your books for me drip with that. Hmm. And, and so, you know, even just, you know, again, I, I started because John and I'll, okay. So I got to say, you know, John gave me this book for free, but because he gave it to me for free, that's not going to, you know, impact my uh, review of the book. What? Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, so I, I opened it and, and I read the first sentence again this morning and God is more present at your work than you know. Hmm. And I thought, yeah. And I think he wants you to know that. Yeah. God wants you to see that he is there and that his spirit is moving in you, through you, and around you as you do your job. You know, I, one of the things, one of my gripes, um, one of my gripes, and, and I know there's, there's been some people in our, you know, I'm a, I'm a heretic for some people in our denomination, and lately with my Jordan Peterson connections, probably increasingly so. But, you know, we're both old enough now that we don't get too upset. We, our nah. reputations are, they are what they are by this point. But um, I know some people get a little nervous around you because it's like, well, will we lose the centrality of the word? But, you know, our tradition says that God speaks through two books. And in church, I think it's right that we, especially in a world that has lost its connection with the Bible, we, we major in the Bible. Yet, you know, when I read yet this, this heresy that we continue to have in the Christian Reformed Church, where, where, where I, will, I will stand up, people say, well, you're the pastor, you should tell me what to think. I say, okay, well, here's what I'm going to tell you what to think. My calling is no, is not of any, while my calling might be a little distinct from each of your callings, it is in a sense not elevated and that your calling to be a rice farmer or to be a hydrologist or to be a mother or to be a grandmother or, you know, that calling, you are called by God to bring his kingdom into this world. That is, you know, when, when we stand before the Lord on Judgment Day, he isn't going to say, oh, wow, Vander Clay, you, yeah, you were a minister. You know, mm -hmm. enter into your peace. Oh, you were just a mom? Well, you know, what did your kid do? Was he a jerk? It's not going to go that way. And this is, our, this is our doctrine and our tradition, and people don't believe it. You tell them that as a pastor, and they say, yeah, yeah, pastor, I know you're supposed to say that, but you know, you know, you really have a more important job. And, and so then I look at your work and say, well, you should read John Van Sloten because he's finding glory in places that I, as a minister of the word, am jealous of. Hmm. And that, and, go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, great, Paul. Um, uh, I, I, I think people in the church, um, uh, I mean, even with these union members, and a lot of them were, most of them were people of faith, right, who had a, a very similar theological worldview as you and I. And yet even for them, there was a naming of glory in places that they hadn't considered God's glory being present before. Um, Christians tend to, I mean, they do what you just said, you know, elevate religious roles over and above ordinary work. Um, but even with ordinary work, they tend to look at the utility of that work. Working for the common good is the thing that comes up all the time in, in uh, faith work conversations. And, uh, uh, you know, I say in the book that, that if, if you believe that working for the common good is the purpose of work, then that's a different kind of idolatry that keeps you from the bigger purpose of work, which is to know who God is uh, through your vocational image bearing, through this parable of you at work. Uh, imaging a God who works. Um, so, so nudging people past the utility part or, or a moral or an ethical or an integrity-based uh, assessment of the value of their work uh, has been uh, and continues to be a crucial part of, of, of what, uh, well, it's what the book is about. Um, and, and every conversation I have with people yesterday, talking with these union people, trying to nudge them past just being a servant or loving the person like you love yourself and, and, uh, and creating this kind of moral ethical definition of, of, uh, of your work having value. Um, 
Yeah, and that goes for everybody's work. Everybody from the cleaner, the person who's mopping the floors, to the scientist working in the university lab. They're all doing the same thing. They're, they're kind of looking at the utility of their job in terms of working for the common good instead of looking at the very nature of their job as revealing uh, something of the, the, the working nature of God. And so, yeah, as you get to name that, and I don't know why I get to name that. I can just see it all the time. No, it's true, though. You know, I see a cleaner while I'm in the food court, and I think made in the image of a God who takes out the trash to make room for the new. And a clean table is new to me and enables me to flourish and have a meal in a food court, which I shouldn't be having, but I'm having a meal in the food court and theologizing. Um, so yeah, glory, glory everywhere. And, uh, you know, in, in the book, I, I write about uh, heaven on earth, right? And we have this, this vision in, in the church of, of a new heaven and, uh, or a new earth, right? And everything the way it should be. So, I mean, we're going to know God, and I believe we're going to be working there. Um, still, we're going to know God in and through our work all the time. So all of these little bits of glory that we see now are just foretastes. They're pointers. They're hopeful vocational moments uh, within which we can grasp that, that one day perfection of what it's going to mean to be a human being who works with wood or, or loves a child or, or writes for a living or, or creates or does science or creates new molecules, etc. Now, With Jordan Peterson, a really big aspect of his, of what caught my attention early on was his identification of the logos um and so he's i'm not going to get into all kinds of petersonian things but the you know the logos um he, he takes that obviously from john one he gets it from john one is obviously getting it from genesis one 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 of the things that i think about now with the with the ongoing secularization of the culture whereas i think both you and i grew up in a tradition where it was not uncommon to meet people because of their Christian formation who had a oops, internet connection. Is you froze on me, Paul. Okay. You froze on me too. I'm still, I'm going to pause recording until. Okay. So you were doing the logos thing and uh, Genesis and John. Well, and, well, and I think, I think, when we lived, when we lived, when I think both of us knew people growing up that the, the idea of how these two books work together was sufficiently embedded within our tradition that at least some individuals who were doing what we would call secular work had, had a deep sense of God's call and the meaningful nature of this and, and could actually tie that to, to eschatology. And, and part of what I fear about secularization today is what I hear so often, not only in the church, but especially outside the church, where someone says, yeah, I just go to this job to get a paycheck. And, and, and when I hear that, I think that, that you've got this loss of meaning that that has to be crushing for people. So, hmm. so as you're going out and you're talking to people and you're doing a lot of interviewing of all kinds of people, how do you find those who have a sense of meaning and those who are lacking it? And what have you noticed about those two groups? Um, I, I didn't think about a book that would help people uh, who needed to find meaning in their work as, as uh, that was not a motivating factor in terms of writing this. And yet it comes up as it has with you every time, every time somebody uh, reads the book and they go, you know, look, a Walmart greeter, uh, a woman who, an elderly woman who delivered flyers in, in, uh, in his neighborhood, um, an electrician, you know, I mean, these, uh, these are all no job is better than any of the other jobs, but in people's minds, they're, they're uh, more or less meaningful. Um, I, I just wanted to name the glory. Uh, so when a, hot, uh, when a Walmart greeter uh, helps you find your way to the right aisle so that you could buy the right product, your life flourishes 
and they are imaging the hospitality of God. When a woman, uh, an elderly woman in my neighborhood delivers flyers to my home, even though I hate the waste, and, and they usually go straight into the recycling, um, for some people, she's helping them know where products are available at a price that they can afford, and she's helping their lives to flourish, uh, where coupon cutting is an important part of, of their ability to exist. Um, and, and naming that, I mean, I, this is oh, a poor woman. I actually said most of that in more layman's terms on the street when I met the flyer delivery woman on her last day of delivering flyers. And we had a, an impromptu on the street uh, retirement party. And, and I just, I felt like I was, I was um, saying to her how God was seeing her work for all those years, pulling this mm. huge wooden uh, wagon up and down our streets in all seasons and and um, and with the tone and the eye contact and my heart letting her know God's tone and that he sees and his heart was for her and and yeah it wasn't a theological idea that uh, that I sought to unpack it was a relational moment with a human being who when I was able to love her. I was able to see and enabled when I was able to see her, I was able to see the dignity in her as a human being, an image bearer of God. And then knowing that, look at her vocational image bearing and, um, and how her work imaged her maker. And it all just kind of, yeah, cascaded from there. So a noticing that led to a love that, our conversation that led to a love that led to an exegesis of the job that led to um, the naming of that to her on her retirement day that led to the opening chapter of the book. My editor, you know, oh, this can't be in chapter five. We've got to put this right at the front because this is where people are at. But I've had that experience about meaning at work, not just, you know, people have done that math with jobs that are traditionally not seen as meaningful or less meaningful, but I've, I've had new meaning come to judges and to, to scientists and researchers. Uh, I sat in the office of a judge, a Christian judge, uh, a provincial, uh, no, not a federal judge here in Calgary. And um, we're talking about the nature of his work. And he talked about how when he gives his judgments, his MO is that he, he writes it all out, of course, because these are very complex, complex judgments. But then when he gives the judgment, he actually puts what he's written and he says, and this is a very risky thing. I put my written notes down and I give an oral judgment. And sometimes um, because I give an oral judgment because I want to look into the eyes of those upon whom this judgment is coming. And sometimes as I'm giving an oral judgment, I will change my judgment slightly or it'll move this way or that based on the eye contact that he has. Wow. <laughs> so, so he is made in the image of a God who came to us and chose to give an oral judgment based on eye contact that came through relationship with him. He, he took on human flesh so that we could see him and he could see us. And then through that kind of a um, high risk, uh, open court, God, God stepped into open court to give his judgment. I, I saw all these echoes of his maker. And so I named that back to him. And okay, a judge, uh, you know, a, a top a thousand people in Canada with the kind of judgeship he had and, and a person of faith and a very thoughtful person. And I have never saw that before in my work. Um, I, I want to be a, a, a morally just judge. I want to be fair. I want to be honest. I want to have integrity. Uh, but this deeper thing of, you know, you actually are like God in that moment. And, and then the, the, the question for him I asked was, what would it mean to know God in that moment? You're, you're giving the judgment, even as the judge is looking at you and looking at them and, 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 and moving through his image bearing that he, he put into your mind and your rationality and your empirical sensibilities and your sense of justice. And what would it be, know, what would it be like to know God uh, who is present in you, federal judge, as you're giving that judgment? That's where it gets abstract and they sometimes go, whoa, and hopefully think about it. <laughs> you think you about are it a, a little journalist bit. for glory, my friend. <laughs> you are. <laughs> That, that is, you're a journalist for creational glory because yeah. you're, 
God has proclaimed, well, this is, this is what we do as, as pastors, right? I mean, God has proclaimed what's in his word, and we take it, and we, you know, through the work of the Holy Spirit and filtered through our lives and our story and this moment in the world, God proclaims his glory once more, and you just give words to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and so I think of the psalmist, right? My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer, and my imagination is made in the image of an imaginative God, right? And, you know, despite the earlier worries of pride and the self getting in the way, God in his grace just continues to plant something in the imagination that says, look, look, that's just like, that's just like, um, you know, I write about that in the book too, right? I, I've, over the last year in my kind of uh, rejigging of, of my heart, uh, been reading my Bible like crazy, like just whole big swaths and chapters of books and just going through the whole Bible just to, to know the story again so that I have more with which to look through to see God in the world. Um, uh, so this, and the smaller I get and the humbler I get and the more attentive I am to God's signature move in the scriptures, the more I am able to recognize God's signature moves in the world. And, uh, I forget why I was saying all that, but, uh, but it yeah, was beautiful. That, that, it was beautiful. It's a, no, but it's a good move, right? It, it, uh, um, yeah, then this naming of glory thing, uh, I, I don't get, I don't, I don't get how it happens half the time. You know, I was just arguing with these union reps yesterday that, you know, one of the reasons we can claim that our jobs are parables and believe that it's true is a view of the Holy Spirit moving in the world, right? And the Spirit is the author of all truth and holds everything in the cosmos together. And Calvin said, were the Spirit to take its hand off the cosmos, everything would collapse. Um, and that same Spirit is moving in you and me and in human lives, whether we know it or not, people inside or outside of the faith. And and that spirit nudges and, and graciously continues to work through you and, and names and lets you see and, and, and name. And, I mean, that's the best part of my job in life right now is coming alongside people and just naming God's glory already moving in their lives. I mean, that's what happened with the Blue Jays. I was naming the glory of baseball. And, and Metallica, the glory of metal, and and uh, the DNA repair mechanism scientists, you know, the glory of that particular protein that causes healing to happen in our cells. Um, I, I, we just got to get a, a pile more pastors doing this because it's such a huge text, Paul. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I, and and you know, not just pastors, but you know, I think what's exciting about you is that the pastors it's not it's it's always the pastor's job to equip the saints and so you are not only looking to teach pastors to pay attention to the glory in the book of general revelation but you're also equipping the saints to labor because th think of how, think of the tragedy of laboring in the lord's vineyard without seeing his glory and this is what we're seeing throughout the world. And and the heavens... And now it paused right after you said the word glory. And so we're, um, we're, we're, we're having internet troubles, he in Calgary and me in Sacramento, California. But what, what... Oh, I was just talking about the tragedy. The, the tragedy of billions of people laboring in this world not having a sense of meaning or glory that they are surrounded by. And yeah, it's the job of preachers to hopefully help, you know, be used by the Holy Spirit to open their eyes to the glory of what this world demeans as menial labor, such as cleaning up a food court. But, you know, what the pastors are called to equip the saints so that those who are greeting at Walmart or cleaning up the food court, I remember, you know, so Daniel, if you, you know, my Facebook friends knew Daniel, mm -hmm. he used to sleep right in front of my door and, you know, bipolar, horrible alcoholic, um, you know, lots of drama and mess with him. But one of, one of the things that always stuck in my mind was he'd always, he'd always say to me, I'm an asset, not a liability. 
you know, I, I, and so when he was a, when one of his manic phases, he would, you know, try to fix the cement. He would try to clean up the churchyard. He would, you know, and he was depressed phase. He would, he would lay, he would lay against my door and just, I could, I could hear him in my office just fuck, fuck, fuck. I hate life. I hate life. I want to die. I want to die. I want to die. That's all he would do for days on end. And I've been doing that for for the last year, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you know, but but I think you know, I'm an asset, not a liability. He yeah. even even Daniel knew glory, and so when he would do something that he considered a gift to me, he with you know his Mormon, he was a Mormon, his LDS, you know, he touched glory, and I just think the the crushing loss of the billions of people in the world who are disconnected from their glory in this job because, because they can't see it. Hmm. You know? Oh, that's, that's, that's crushing. And yeah. so you come in and you say, stop, look at what you're doing. Yeah. It's full of glory. Yeah. And not to, uh, I mean, the work is hard and a lot of people have uh, very difficult work and, and highly repetitive and, and may not be self-actualizing as much as, as they could, um, regardless of where they're placed. But yeah, we do have a white collar versus, at least where I live, white collar versus blue collar bias, right? High income versus low income bias. Um, uh, leadership versus following bias, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know if I wrote about it in the book, but I, I have often, often have the thought that uh, you know, the difference from between the, the Nobel Prize winning scientist or business person and, and the most lowly job on the planet um, is, is infinitesimal when we're all compared to the uh, nature of a working God and what God has done. You know, um, Abraham Kuyper, a Dutch theologian, said there isn't a thing that exists in the cosmos that wasn't a thought in the mind of God before it ever came to be. So God's a physicist, <laughs> Nobel <laughs> Prize winning physicist, um, who, you know, and any good Nobel Prize winning physicist would know they know nothing when they're on the edge of knowing what they know. Um, and so that you know, you get a God's eye view on the dignity, uh, but even that then is kind of operating out of a worldview as that, that would say, um, you know, that there are other jobs that do have dignity, when in fact that dignity is a little bit of a misnomer, relatively speaking, in comparison to a working God. So, yeah, uh, dignity for all jobs, even the lowly Nobel laureate, um, his job has dignity before God and, and God gracefully looks upon and delights in their work as he does uh, uh, the person framing a new house down the street in the new subdivision and, and, and every other job that people do. Um, it, it, you know, again, this whole idea of judging people's work by the utility of the work is maybe problematic. When you start, when you pull it back to our Imago Dei image bearing, just in, in doing the things, you know, like working with our hands. Um, what does it mean to know the Jesus who's seated at the right hand of God now with hands through your hands as you work in a greenhouse? Um, what is it like to know God through uh, all of your senses and your body? Um, as a laborer, uh, lifting things, <laughs> um, we don't we don't even talk. It sounds like crazy talk, right? That that, but who knows? That could be more valuable to God. You know, in my book, I write about my son Edward, my publisher. <laughs> he says, "Okay, it's a great book. You're writing about scientists and all these people with fancy jobs. What about a young man with Down syndrome? How would how would this book say anything to them?" And he didn't know that I had a son with Down syndrome. <laughs> Wow. So I thought, you know, that's a bit of an oversight. And so I write a story about Edward and folding towels at the YMCA, which is one of his part-time jobs, and huge dignity in that work. And I don't doubt for a second that God is as proud of Edward in his towel-folding moment as he is of me and my work and you and yours and a Nobel laureate in their work. Um, uh, God is... God is no respecter of person, vo vocational persons in, in those places, right? And, well, and, and one of the things, you know, I love that you brought up Edward in this, because one of the things that I think about, uh, Jordan Peterson makes a point in one of his classes that the U.S. Army now will not take anyone with an IQ of 
of less than something like 87, which is basically 10% of the population. And a, a number of the people that, that I know and work with are on disability, um, often, mm -hmm. you know, one kind of disability or another. And, you know, Freddie, who I do the Freddie and Paul show, Freddie is on disability. And, you know, part of what I, what, part of what I fear is that as work gets increasingly complex, more and more population, well, maybe a generous government will, will give them just enough money to survive and they'll maybe give them some crappy, this is in the US, you probably get better medical care in Canada, but some crappy medical care and that doesn't include dental, so they've always got problem with their teeth. And, but, and I think, okay, you know, yeah, so let's say you gave them gloriously better benefits, hmm. but the crushing thing that, that so many who say live on disability and maybe in a group home is they have, they just have nothing to do. They, mm -hmm. they, they feel like they have nothing to contribute. And so, you know, every waking moment is a kind of hell because they're divorced from, you know, they're divorced from the ability to have this glory. And I, I think about, um, I think about Billy Almond, who, so I grew up in Patterson right next to Prospect Park. Prospect Park was Dutch Hill, you know, for a while when the Dutch immigrants were there. And Billy Allman was um, in the old language. I don't know what his diagnosis would be, what he was called retarded. And he rode around on this crappy little bike through Prospect Park, but he was the town crier. He, was, he would always spread the gossip around and everybody knew Billy Allman. And there was a, there was a place for him in that neighborhood. And, and I look at many of the people today who, um, you know, they're, they're disabled because of mental illness or some other thing. And, and I think in a village, they might have worked in a field. And from the time they were young, they would have gotten used to working in a field. They would have had a role or they could have worked in a bakery. I knew Frank Foster at Northside Chapel was disabled. And, you know, he was able to work in a bakery. And increasingly, I see in our world, it's getting technologically more and more sophisticated. More and more of the population, the, the government can say, okay, here's, here's $800 a month so you don't starve and you have a room over your head. But we're going to warehouse you and there's not going to be any place for you in this world to know God's glory. And again, it's just, it's just horrible. Hmm. And, and, and no, the, neither the left nor the right, you know, nobody's paying attention to these people hmm. and, and, Oh, we got to give them better benefits. Oh, they should work for a living. And it's like, I once had a woman. So there's a, a, a yard next to it, next to us here that the supermarket owns and it's full of garbage and a woman knocks on my door and she sees the homeless people around. She says, I I've got $50. Could, you know, could you take this and pay some of these homeless people to clean out that vacant lot? And it's like, lady, it ain't going to work because mm -hmm. they've, these people, it, you know, it, it's just not going to work because we have lost something. And then, and, and again, the loss is just, the loss is just, the loss is just grim. So, you know, and I think, so I love your story about Edward and folding towels because I think, yeah, everybody needs to participate in this glory. Yeah. 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 And, you know, 200 years ago, maybe Edward would have, you know, been born on a farm and been able to find a good labor job that was commensurate with his giftings. But um, Edward now, and uh, this is perhaps uniquely Canadian, right? He's got so many supports around him and, and workers who come alongside him that enable him to do that work mm. at the YMCA or, or calling bingo at the Asian seniors home. <laughs> he can't even talk he has no communication skills and he apparently had called bingo there um the, the, i love it <laughs> so uh, you know a developed society um where there may be losses in terms of some of those opportunities uh, has found a way at least in our context to continue to provide opportunities but this is uh you know this is a unique context i realize that uh I, I share your worry, right? Because how do you fit in um, when, I mean, I feel that I'm, I'm 56 and in an increasingly technological <laughs> world, uh, can I keep up? I mean, how does uh, someone with a disability find their place? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, any, anything you want to plug? I mean, I, 
I just, I appreciate you taking the time and, you know, we might talk again sometime if either of us says, hey, I've got an idea, let's talk again. Because to me, um, you know, what you're doing is really valuable. And I, I really do want more people reading your books and I'll put links to them in the, in the notes. Um, but I, you know, I, I really respect the work that you do and I think it's important and, and I do want more people to know about it because it's unlike, you know, we pastors, you know, we talk about, you know, Jesus and the Bible and all of these things. And I'm not in any way, you know, I love talking about that. I'll talk about that all the time, but for most of the people that I'm talking to, this disconnect between God's glory, which they are simply immersed in, and their appreciation of it is, 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 just a, is, is just a crushing loss. And I think you fit that gap. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good word, Paul. And I mean, I, I don't think that talking about God's revelation through uh, general revelation is not talking about Jesus. I mean, we believe in a Jesus who's seated at the right hand of God, who's holding the cosmos together, that everything was made through him. There isn't a thing that exists that wasn't made through him. Uh, there isn't a thing that exists that his Holy Spirit isn't holding in place and moving along. It doesn't have intention for making new or is in the process of making new. Um, th that Jesus is moving and living uh, and resurrected and ascended and 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 bringing and holding life in all things in in him we live and move and have our being everything uh, is being held together in and through Christ so I'm talking about Jesus all the time um, at, at first when we w I went down this road I mean a lot of people and even I thought you know, you're mostly just talking about God right how can you get to Christ through general revelation but if you look at even as Christ was embedded in the Old Testament in all kinds of veiled and hidden ways, this is that. Uh, it's true looking out uh, for Christ in general revelation. This in the Bible is that, and he's moving in that place. I, I had a Calvin Theological Seminary professor, Sidney Gradonis, come up to me after a talk, and uh, he said, I think I, I see what you're doing. You know, I've spent my whole life trying to connect the Jesus of the Old Testament to the Jesus of the New, and you're connecting the Jesus of the Bible to Jesus out in the world, moving in creation. And that's exactly, and they're two connected things. Jesus new and old, Jesus in the Bible and out there. That's exactly what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be called to it and uh, spend the rest of my life figuring it out. So how can people find your work? Uh, JohnVanSloten.com, a new author website I had to create for every job of a parable. And if you go there, there's uh, just a few blog posts. I'm just getting started there. But I posted a ton of sermon videos. So all the vocational sermons are there. So there's about 35 sermons on everything from a firefighter to an electrician to all of the ones we've talked about. Um, there's sermons on music. So the Metallica, I just uploaded the old Metallica sermon that uh, Warner Music shot uh, this morning. So music sermons, um, all of that is there. And uh, yeah, some, some of the media stuff. And so if people want to find out what it's about or in information on the books, they can find it there. Okay. Okay. Super. Well, thank you so much, John. Hang on. Don't hang up. I'm just going to stop the recording. And, uh, and, and so then we can finish up. We can finish up.